The Cotswolds. An area of outstanding natural beauty covering more than 2,000 square kilometers, spanning six counties. Since the Middle Ages, the Cotswolds has been a center for fine woolen cloth making, thanks to the abundance of native sheep that grazed its gentle rolling uplands. Evidence of the wealth that the woolen trade brought to the area is reflected in the fine wool churches, and grand merchants' houses that characterize the local landscape. Nestled beneath the escarpment where the Cotswold Hills meet the Severn Valley lies the Gloucestershire market town of Dursley. At first, it seems an unlikely birthplace for a heavy engineering company, yet in the early 1800s, it was destined to become synonymous with a name that would later become recognized the world over. For Yorkshireman George Lister, who moved to Dursley in 1817, it was the perfect location to set up a card-making and wire-drawing business. Cards are the wire brushes used in the woolen cloth industry to aid alignment of the fibres prior to spinning. At that time, carding was a laborious process largely done by hand, but by the mid-1800s, mechanisation was spreading throughout the textile industry, from the cotton mills of Lancashire to the woolen mills of the Stroud Valleys, just a few miles from Dursley. The Stroud Valley spawned some 150 woolen cloth mills, thanks to the abundance of raw material and numerous rivers and streams that provided water power for the weaving looms. George's son, Robert Ashton Lister, the third youngest of eight siblings, exhibited his father's condenser and carding machine at the Paris Exposition of 1867. Lister was one of more than 50,000 exhibitors at the six-month-long event, which attracted over nine million visitors. It provided the perfect opportunity to showcase the company's products to the world. After returning from Paris, George and his son became estranged, owing, it said, to differences over the future direction of the company. This acrimony drove the ambitious Ashton, as he was known, to strike out on his own. Before the year was out, he'd formed R.A. Lister & Company to manufacture a range of agricultural machinery, including horse-drawn harrows and rakes. Never one to pass up an opportunity to expand and diversify, in 1889, Ashton acquired the UK rights to manufacture and sell Danish engineer Michael Pedersen's new cream separator. Using a spinning centrifuge, the machine was designed to separate cream from milk. It could run at a constant speed, so creating a regular consistency of cream, much of which was turned into butter on dairy farms. Marketed in the UK and throughout the British Empire as the Alexandra Cream Separator, its success resulted in Pedersen moving to Dursley to set up a local manufacturing base and work on further product innovations in the dairy sector. Meanwhile, in 1870, just three years after their rift, Ashton's father George died, leaving the business to his brother-in-law William. William renounced all claim to it, and it was put in the hands of executors to manage until his two sons took over in the late 1890s. They expanded and diversified the business from its roots in woolen cloth-making machinery and transformed it into the Lister Electric Light and Power Manufacturing Company, bringing electricity to the people of Dursley for the first time. When William died in 1903, R.A. Lister took over the business and created the Lister Electrical Machinery Company, with a view to pioneering mechanization based on this exciting new energy source. 
by now, Listers had redesigned Pedersen's cream separator and expanded its product range to include sheep shearing machinery. It was also producing milk churns and wooden barrels for making butter. Timber offcuts from the churns and barrels didn't go to waste as these were used to manufacture a successful line in garden furniture. Pedersen had also been busy working alongside Ashton Lister on his design for a brand new type of bicycle. In 1899, they formed the Dursley Pedersen Cycle Company. Constructed from thin metal tubes in a truss formation, for which it said Pedersen got his inspiration from the recently opened 4th Railway Bridge in Scotland, it featured a hammock-style saddle, which claimed to be more comfortable and some 12 times lighter than one made from leather and springs. By the early 1920s, some 30,000 units had been produced. However, because Pedersen's design was considerably more expensive than conventional bicycles of the day, it never achieved the mass-market appeal Pedersen had hoped for and was subsequently licensed to other manufacturers. But many of the license fees due to Pedersen remained unpaid. He may have been a great inventor and engineer, but his poor business sense saw him cheated out of payments. Returning to his native Denmark in 1920, in poor health and with a failed marriage, he died a pauper nine years later and was buried in an unmarked grave. However, in 1995, a group of bicycle enthusiasts had his remains exhumed and reinterred in Dursley, along with a headstone, to ensure his achievements would be remembered. It was in 1909 that the first stationary petrol engines made their way off the production line following the acquisition of manufacturing rights from London-based FC Southwell & Company. They immediately proved popular for powering electric generators and Lister's own sheep shearing machines, which until now had been hand-cranked devices requiring two people to operate them. That same year, a separate division, Lister Shearing, was established in premises adjacent to the main works to manufacture a new generation of powered shearers, clippers and blades. With the outbreak of the First World War, Lister turned to manufacturing for the war effort and production of petrol engines, lighting sets and munitions components took the factory to capacity. Much of the workforce was now comprised of women whose menfolk had left to fight on the front. But it wasn't all work and no play for the women workers of Lister, as this footage of obstacle races being held on fields above the town in 1915 shows. When hostilities ceased, Britain enjoyed a short-lived economic boom. But by 1921, the country was heading for recession and increased competition from abroad meant Lister needed to innovate. But it wasn't until 1926 that the company launched the revolutionary Auto Truck. Auto Truck was a tricycle vehicle with a single leading wheel used to both drive and steer the vehicle. Simplicity was key. The original design came from Somerset-based Auto Mower Engineering, who two years earlier had demonstrated a prototype to Lister. It was put on trial in their factory. Listers liked it so much they bought the patents, designs and rights to manufacture from Automower and thus began a new and highly successful chapter in the company's history. Auto trucks were used for transporting light loads around factories and warehouses, docksides, railway yards and military installations. They were sold throughout the world and some still remain in service today, like this one working on a railway station in Sri Lanka. Newsreel from 1931 depicts the Duke of York, later King George VI, driving an auto truck during a visit to the Lister factory. Production of the auto truck continued until 1973. It's said that over 3,000 variants were built, as well as a rail truck version. This was a light locomotive designed to run on 24-inch gauge rails and temporary tracks on construction sites and in quarries, mines and peat bogs. Many auto and rail trucks still survive and are regularly exhibited and demonstrated at events around the country. 
In December 1929, the now Sir Robert Ashton Lister died at the age of 84. He was knighted in 1911, served as a Liberal Member of Parliament for Stroud, and was awarded a CBE in the 1919 New Year Honours. That same year, the company introduced its first diesel engine, in a move that would play a huge part in securing the company's fortunes. The first model had a single cylinder and produced nine horsepower, hence it was known as the 9-1. Further models were soon introduced and the company continued to expand its range with the addition of new engines every year or two. By 1936, Lister had what was arguably the largest range of petrol and diesel engines of their type in the world, including some 80 petrol and 40 diesel models. It was also the area's largest employer, with a workforce of almost 3,000. Simplicity, reliability and ease of maintenance were qualities for which Lister petrol engines were already held in high regard, and their diesel counterparts proved to be no exception. Wherever standby or off-grid power generation was required, from hospitals to lighthouses and farmsteads to mines, Lister diesel engines delivered, thus securing the company a worldwide market. As well as its extensive range of engines, the company also produced 90 models of pump and pumping plant, 25 models of generating plant and was the biggest producer of cream separators with a range of 18 sizes and types. Lister also claimed to shear one-third of the world's sheep with its 20 different types of shears and clippers and hundreds of different attachments. Aside from all of this, Lister was still producing churns, garden and street furniture, plus a variety of agricultural machinery, including ploughs, harrows, rakes and elevators. With the outbreak of World War II, many workers were called up for service. Products manufactured during the next few years included engines, agricultural implements and shell cases in increasing numbers. In 1940, as part of a tour of British factories to boost the war effort, Queen Mary paid a visit to Lister's. Just as her son, King George VI, had done nearly a decade earlier, Her Majesty also took a ride around the works on an auto truck. The company certainly played its part in serving the national cause. Lister opened new factories for component assembly at nearby Nymphsfield and Wooten Under Edge, and another at Cinderford in the Forest of Dean. During the post-war years of the 1940s and throughout the 50s and 60s, Lister introduced a steady stream of new engines, predominantly diesels. In 1950, Lister was granted a royal warrant to supply agricultural machinery and dairy equipment to the king. Between 1951 and 1969, 56 new models entered the company's portfolio and 19 were withdrawn. This period also saw much reorganization of the factory and the introduction of modern machines and production facilities. In 1965, just two years before its centenary, RA Lister & Co was acquired by the Hawker Sidley Group, with Sir Percy Lister remaining as chairman and managing director and continuing to influence the direction of the company. In the late 1970s, with a healthy order book, the range of Lister engines was rationalized to remain competitive in an increasingly global market, strengthened further in 1986 by the merger with Petter Limited to form Lister Petter Limited, a name that still dominates the diesel engine market today. In 2016, some former Lister workers reunited to celebrate the 90th birthday of the acclaimed and highly popular D-type stationary petrol engine, where they were addressed by Fred Lister, the grandson of the company founder Ashton Lister. Of an engine, and my father, they fell over a pile of horse manure, I can tell you that. And, uh... Manufactured between 1926 and 1964, the 1.5 horsepower Lister D is regarded by many as the ultimate symbol of the company's legacy. It was particularly popular with farmers who used it to power their milking parlors, shear sheep, grind corn, pump water, and generate electricity. But if imitation truly is the sincerest form of flattery, then the many Indian and Chinese companies that now produce copies of original Lister engines for export, euphemistically and affectionately known as Listeroids, stand as testimony to the worldwide demand which still exists for the original, reliable, 
low-maintenance, infinitely adaptable workhorses that proudly bear the Lister name. The legacy of RA Lister's many and diverse products lives on. Engineering enthusiasts and preservation societies restore and regularly exhibit and demonstrate examples of the company's engines, machines and vehicles spanning more than a century. And here, in this museum, you can browse many such working examples, 